a lot of you who supported uh, the issuing of uh, Estonian translation of book uh, Philip Malakis uh, knows already this name. Philip is, uh, together with his wife Georgia, he is a uh, father of seven children. He lives in Boston, so he feels uh, close to the same jet lag what I feel right now, uh, where he is assistant professor of uh, pastoral care in Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. And uh, he got his PhD from Purdue University in uh, child development and family uh, studies, specializing in marriage and uh, family therapy. And I do encourage everybody of you uh, after, uh, so we'll have a session of three uh, presentations right now, and it will be followed by the presentation of the book of uh, this Estonian translation of book of Philip Mamalakis. I do encourage everybody of you to be part of uh, that program as well. So please. Reverend clergy, teachers, parents, and guests, it is a delight to be here this afternoon. Uh, actually, I think for my body, it's this morning, but it's wonderful to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for all their efforts in uh, putting this conference on. It is true, uh, I do have a PhD, and I do, I'm a professor at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Seminary, but today I would just like to tell you a story. Uh, one day, I watched my son George, who was 10, go to the kitchen cupboard and get a muffin that he had hidden away. It was the last muffin, and George had listened to his mom and waited patiently until after the kitchen was clean to eat it. Marcos, his older brother, age 12, saw the last muffin that George was holding and, as fast as he could, ran right by George, grabbed the muffin, shoving it into his mouth. Now, we might wish that George would have a calm, reasonable response and say something kind and sweet like, okay, my dear brother, your desire for that muffin is so much and I love you as my brother, and I know that it is better to give than to receive. You may have my muffin. Of course, George is 10, and his brother just stole his muffin. He did not say that. What did he do? In an instant, he screamed as loud as he, as loud as he could, you stole my muffin, and ran after Marcos, who was heading out the door. Marcos, realizing that George was going to catch him, dropped the muffin on the sidewalk and ran down the street. George picked up his half-eaten muffin and cried, he stole my muffin. Of course, he still ate the muffin off the ground, but he was still upset. He took my muffin. As a parent, when you see this happen, what do you do? We might wish that we can have a calm, reasonable response but it is difficult. We are tempted, what are we tempted to do? We scream. And what do we scream? Marcos, get back here. How could you do that? And should we hit Marcos? And why do we react like this? Is it because we reflect for a moment and think that the best response is to scream at Marcos? No, we react because we are not thinking. We react because it is upsetting to see this happen and, in my house, see this happen all the time. We get upset, frustrated, overwhelmed, embarrassed, or angry, and we lose control. How can my child behave like that? This is not okay to take something and run. I don't have time for this. What a selfish, greedy child. And we think about how we can punish Marcos so he never does that again. He should not do that, or should he? We react as if our goal as parents is to stop bad behavior from happening. So when we see our kids making mistakes or losing control, we think this is bad and we need to fix it. But the truth is, kids make mistakes, lose control, misbehave, or sin. 
In fact, as adults, we make mistakes, lose control, misbehave, and sin. Do we need to do something to Marcos so he never takes George's muffin again? Is that even possible? Is there something I can do so that Marcos never takes something from George, or George never bothers Marcos, or my children never fight or struggle with each other? That's impossible. And if this is what we're thinking when our kids misbehave, we will react. Because internally, our emotions get stirred up. We feel a tension, almost like a fire raging in our hearts. And the fire gets so hot, so quickly, we can feel so trapped and hopeless that we lose our peace, lose our self-control, and react. And how does losing control help our children? And what does losing control teach our children? Does our losing control help Marcos learn how to control himself? More likely, it teaches him to be afraid of us, that he is bad, and that adults are allowed to lose control. What do we want to teach our children? What do we want our children to learn? Parenting is more than just stopping bad behavior in the short term. We want Marcos to learn how to resist the temptation to take something no matter how much he really wants it. We want him to learn self-control. We want to teach our children how to be kind to one another, how to share, to be generous, to be patient. Reacting to this situation is not going to teach self-control. I don't just want my son to learn not to grab his brother's food. I want my kids, when they go away to college or live on their own, to know what is right and wrong and have the ability to choose what is right when they are tempted by their desires. I want to raise kids who, when they're married, have learned how to control their impulses and reactions so they can enter into loving relationships. What kind of husband will my son be if he never learns how to control his impulses and desires? And what kind of wife will my daughter be if she has not learned patience, kindness, and self-control? We want our kids to acquire the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is jo love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. We want to raise children who know how to live in the world according to God's ways, God's values, and God's virtues. Our goal is to raise kids who internalize the values and virtues of the kingdom of God. Meekness, purity of heart, peacemaking, patience, long-suffering, faithfulness. So when they go away to college or get married, they live according to these values. Not because we are watching but be or because we say so but because they believe these things deeply in their hearts. Parenting is more than just teaching kids the truth about how to behave or how to treat people. We want our kids, by the time they leave our homes as adults, to internalize what is true about who they are and who they are called to become. Successful kids know deep in their hearts that they are loved by God and by us and desire to freely return that love. Our goal is to help our children to see themselves and others as children of God. If from the beginning we teach them true wisdom, they will have greater wealth and glory than riches can provide, St. John Chrysostom. How do we teach them? What saves and makes for good children is the life of the parents in the home. The parents need to devote themselves to, love, to the love of God. They need to become saints in relation to their children. And the joy that will come to them, the holiness that will visit them, will shower grace on their children. Elder Porfirios, wounded by love. The single most powerful parenting tool we have to raise our kids is the way we live our lives. Children learn the most from modeling their parents' behaviors. Our children are wired to model what we say, how we act, how we treat people, what we value, what we prioritize, how we live, and even what we believe. When we have good relationships with our children, they tend to acquire our values and beliefs, our virtues, and our passions. In part, this is genetic, and in part, it's just by watching us. 
How many times in a moment of stress or anger do you find yourself saying the very things your parents said to you, even if you said you would never say those things to your kids? Robert Fulgram writes, don't worry that children never listen to you. Worry that they are always watching you. This is either good news for parents or bad news. Our kids can tell what's important in life by what their parents think is important. Our kids can tell what's real and true by how we live in the privacy of our homes, more than how we act in public. I'm going to skip to the, right after the quote. If we want our kids to internalize the values and virtues of the kingdom of God, they need to see those values and virtues modeled in their parents. If we yell at a child to be patient or criticize a child by saying, you're mean, we are not teaching patience or kindness, but anger and criticism. We don't need to force our kids to do the right thing when they are tempted. We need to force ourselves to do the right thing when we are tempted. And they will follow because they are watching. And when do we teach them? When do our children learn patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control? When they see their brother's muffin and they really, really want it. There's only one way to learn patience and self-control in the hundreds of struggles that happen daily in the home. And if this is what they are learning in the daily struggles, that means two things. Number one, your children should not be patient. They should not be kind or have self-control. They should not share and they should not listen to you. Rather, they should be learning patience. They should be learning to be kind and learning self-control, learning how to share and how to listen to you. In the daily struggles of the home is when they are learning, which means that we should expect them to make mistakes and expect them to struggle. The home is the practice field, like learning soccer. When you practice, you make a lot of mistakes and keep trying until you get better. Second, if they are always learning, then we are always teaching. We are teaching them how to be patient, even when you're tempted to become angry. We are teaching them how to do the right thing, even when you don't want to. And we are teaching these things to them in the struggles. They are learning how to respond in the struggles by watching how we respond in the struggles. To do that, we need to resist the temptation to overreact when we see Marcos running away with George's muffin. However, if we do nothing just because they are learning, Marcos will think that this is okay behavior, and George will think that we don't care. We don't overreact or under-respond. To respond appropriately, we need to take some time when we're calm to learn what to do so that when these things happen, we know how to respond. It's difficult in the moment to think about how to respond. This means the first thing we need to do, number one, take a deep breath. Say a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Before we do anything, we need to calm ourselves down. Nothing good will happen if we are angry or reacting. Skip. It is easy when we feel that internal tension, that internal fire, to feel desperate, like we have to do something right away. We say a prayer to focus on Christ in those moments and open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. We need to remember, what we need to remember is that Christ is with us in this eternal fi internal fire. In chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, we all know the story of the three youth in the fire. King Nebuchadnezzar threw the three youth in the fire, and what happened? the king saw four men in the fire, walking around completely unharmed. What the fathers understand is that Christ joined the youth in the fire, and the youth, who were focused on Christ, were unaffected by the fire. Notice, though, that Christ did not put out the fire. We know that if he wanted to, he could have put out the fire in an instant and replaced it with beautiful flowers and grass, but he didn't. 
he let the fire rage. Why? Because this is a demonstration of his true power over the fire. He does not need to put out the fire because in Christ, the fire has no effect on the youth. As parents, we need to focus on Christ when we find ourselves in that fire. Not because he will put out the fire, but when we focus on Christ in the fire, it loses its effect on us. Parenting is about focusing on Christ in the fire rather than reacting in the fire. We focus on Christ by taking a deep breath, saying a prayer, and number two, draw close. Draw close to the child and check in. And whom should we draw close to? Well, I'm going to skip to the next paragraph. Parenting is about loving persons more than controlling behavior. And before we do anything, we should check in with the child. It is easy to get distracted by the misbehaviors and lose sight of the person behind the behaviors. Drawing close means connecting with the child before correcting a child. So I drew close to George who was crying. I did not say anything because he was upset. Marcos took my muffin, he cried. There is no reason to speak when a child is so upset, but there is a reason to be close. But it is difficult to to draw close. Parenting is about drawing close to our children in the struggle, not solving the struggle. The struggle is not a problem to solve, but the path of learning and growing. And children are not problems to be solved, but persons to be loved. Number three, empathize. Name his feelings. You're mad that Marcos took your muffin, I asked. I waited to have this. It was my muffin, George cried out. Be careful, because when you empathize and name their feelings, you can make his internal fire increase. I'm going to get him. You have to do something, George cried out to me. No matter how hot the fire gets, we stay close and name his feelings. We can take the side of George's feelings. We can understand that it's painful when bad things happen to us, when people treat us poorly or unfairly. That is painful. We can come alongside George in his pain, in his tension. That is love. We join him in his struggle, and he learns that we care and we understand. Skip. Just before the the next paragraph. My internal fire gets bigger as I draw close to George's internal fire. I can feel more hopeless because there is nothing I can do to stop this fire. We must parent in hope. We know it's hot, but we live with a hope that the fire will pass, the fire will not burn us, and that we grow in love as we walk in faith through the fire. We focus on his feelings because we are attending to the inner life of the child, rather than just the outer behavior. Our goal is that our child acquires the Holy Spirit, which is an inner process of growth and transformation. We want to be attentive and gentle with the souls of our children, no matter what they are struggling with. Sister Magdalene writes, a child's heart is sacred God, sacred ground where he meets God. Number four, name his struggle. It hurts when someone takes our food, It's hard when we're treated like that, I say to George. What is George struggling with? George is struggling with living in a world where people misbehave, treat others poorly or selfishly. It's painful to experience that. Of course, George is guilty of treating Marcos in the same way. He takes Marcos' food, fights with Marcos, and hurts Marcos. But he's not thinking of his own sins and transgressions. He's thinking about punishing Marcos for Marcos' sins and transgressions. If I want George to learn how to be kind and respectful, naming his struggles allows him to experience what it's like for others when he does the same thing. Naming the struggle does not make things better or help George get out of the fire. It helps him see and understand the path of life and love and experience the growth that comes through the struggle to follow Christ. It's hard to be in relationships. I want George to understand this and learn how to respond with mercy and forgiveness. The words I use in these moments will help George understand the path of life. So we name it. 
Number five, set limits to behavior. Just because I understand George's pain does not mean I need to agree with his behaviors. George is free to feel what he is feeling, to struggle with what he is struggling with. And I can join him in that struggle, but he is not free to act out of those desires. And I need to be strict about that. We might be tempted to ignore a child's feelings and be strict about their behavior, or be attentive to a child's feeling, but not strict on their behavior. We want to be very attentive, very close, responsive, and caring about his feelings, and very strict about his behavior. This communicates to George that I'm on his side, and he cannot act out of his impulses for revenge. I'm going to skip. And what about Marcos? After checking in with George, I go to Marcos. And what do I do? The same thing. Say a prayer. Draw close and check in. Marcos, I say, what's going on? And I say it in a calm, firm voice. If I attack Marcos with anger, he's likely to react with anger and defensiveness. That's not what I want. I want Marcos to see what he's done, to recognize he made a mistake, to take responsibility and do the right thing. For that, I draw close without aggression. I empathize and name his feelings. Did you really want that muffin? I asked calmly. He looked down and said, yes. <laughs> Was it hard to control yourself? Marcos does not need to be attacked or criticized for falling into temptation. He needs to recognize what happened, learn to learn how to succeed in life and relationships to follow Christ. Marcos dropped his head and looked at the ground. He realized what he had done. Go in and apologize to George, I said. He walked quietly back to George in the house. If he had denied what he did wrong or fought back, I would have done the same thing, named his struggle, but maybe set some limits. Skip to the next path, next paragraph. Marcos walked back into the house and said quietly, forgive me, George, for taking your muffin. And what do you think George did when Marcus returned and asked forgiveness? Because I'm running out of time, I will just say that he is 10 and he reacted like a 10-year-old. I don't forgive you. And he looked at me and said again, you have to do something. And what did I do? I repeated the same steps. Take a deep breath, say a prayer, draw close, empathize, name his struggle, and state the behavioral expectations. I know you're upset, George. In this house, we forgive. It doesn't feel to me like I did anything. I didn't solve the problem, and it can feel hopeless because they will still struggle, still misbehave and make mistakes. And that feeling of hopelessness can cause us to react. And that's what George said, you never do anything, as he realized that I could not fix what happened. I would not yell at Marcos. Marcos doesn't get a punishment. Maybe he does. Maybe he makes George's bed or does a chore because that's part of the learning, but he doesn't need to be yelled at. And what does George not say is that he does the same thing to his brothers. Final comments. I have taken some time to share this particular situation about what is happening in our children internally as they misbehave. This whole situation lasted only a few minutes. We did not sit down and have long talks about this. I don't have time for that. And these situations happen all the time. In reality, we only have a few moments to respond or barely any time to respond. What we do have is a choice as parents in those moments to either react out of anger or take a deep breath, say a prayer, draw close, empathize, name the struggle, State the behaviors you want to see. Sometimes the only time I have is to say a prayer, name the struggle, set a limit. Because we're running out the door late for something. I don't have time. In that small interaction, I can feel like I did nothing. The good news is, these interactions happen all the time. We have hundreds of these interactions throughout our days, weeks, months, and years with our children and their learning. They will not remember the specific instances that happen. What they will, what will happen as we respond, 
the same way through all the instances is that they will remember how we responded. We hope that something will arise out of this suffering. Added that line from the last presentation. We hope something will arise out of that suffering. It is a lot like how a beautiful impressionist painter paints a painting. Or a beautiful sculptor sculpts a statue. Hundreds of small brush strokes or little chips on a stone. Each one seems very small and insignificant. But when you add up the hundreds of brush strokes that the artist makes, you have a masterpiece. Romans 5, 5, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. In the tensions and struggles of daily life, although we feel like we're doing nothing or feel like we are losing, we focus on Christ and parent in hope that over the years we have with our children, God will be working in their hearts so that after 18 years of these little interactions, he will create a masterpiece. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. I would like to believe there will be questions from auditorium. Yeah. Um, what do you do when you disagree with your spouse on how you should react to something your children did uh, or how, to, how they should be punished? Well, my wife needs to do what I think, but you're asking what other people should do? <laughs> two things. It's good for children to have two different parents who parent in different ways. And it's good for the marriage when the two of you take time and come up with a plan together. We live in this tension of two becoming one in marriage. So we cannot push our spouse away, and we cannot uh, impose our will, and we cannot make our wife do what we want. But those differences are good, and that struggle in marriage is important. Take time out to work on that. Thank you. Можно просить еще раз задать вопрос? Одну секундочку. Кустура про Гуинглиса Тельга, мисканалист. Uh, oh, теперь слышно. Uh, что делать, если я чувствую опустошение, уже нет сил, но при этом голова понимает, как соображать, но чувство сильнее, чем, чем голова, скажем так. Если я, я знаю, что делать, но я не могу, я настолько опустошен этими ситуациями. Как в таких ситуациях поступать? Can you repeat the first part of the question? Just the first part. Может повторить первую часть вопроса? So, I will answer what I think the question is. I can tell the question. Please. The question was what to do if you know what you should do but you can't. Yes. What do we do when we know what we should do and we can't? Number one 
is you admit that. Admit it. Number two, you share your struggle with someone. Because depending on what we believe about the Holy Spirit and how God works, this struggle is an invitation to grow in love. It's a lot like what you would say is, I see 200 pounds and I can't lift 200 pounds. The answer is, you put it down to 50 and you keep exercising. The, in the struggle is where we grow. So the first step is you take responsibility. I want to do that, but I can't. Number two, share with someone. What does it mean I can't? Really? I can't or I don't want to? And somebody, if you could share that struggle, then we start learning, maybe I can, maybe I don't want to. Maybe I need to learn that I must. And we grow in that. What would you ask your son if I asked Marcos, you know, you can't take the muffin. And he says, I know I shouldn't, but I can't control myself. I say, that's not okay. You must control yourself. And he says, I understand. It's the struggle of growing and failing and getting it back up again. Uh, maybe I can also <clears throat> ask one question. <clears throat> Well, you have seven children, right? We probably all know that it's important to spend time with the family as a whole family, not just father going with kids, but mother as well. <clears throat> but how crucial is that important? You know, because we're all busy nowadays, even some of us working on the weekends. <clears throat> so to what extent it's important to spend the time as a whole family for their even, even you can say kingdom of God? To what extent is it important to exercise? To what extent is it important to eat healthy food? The more you have a rhythm as a family, the better your children do. Your children don't need all your time, but they need regular time. So when you're young, I would try and have a meal every evening, a, a, a routine. As they grow older, maybe once a week. Uh, so the more you pay attention to your kids, the better they do. But there's something else, too. When we're together, we're doing other things. I have work, they have work, they're cleaning, they're fighting, they're doing their work. It's also important as a dad, as a man, when I am home, to be home, to be present. Because they don't need all my time, but they need me to be present when I am home. So the more we're present when we're home and get to know them, the better. When we have time together, the better. I'm in Estonia and my seven kids are in America. <laughs> the answer is every day. I mean, I have seven. I have them all on my phone. I text them. And every one or two days, I remind myself, text this one, text that one. The ones that have now grown up to go into college. And I look at all my kids, and every day when I come home, I said, have I said hi to this one? Have I touched this one? I'm, I put it in. When the kids were young, one night a week, I was home every week that night. Now they're older, they have homework. It's my responsibility to stay connected to them, to stay close to them, and to put an interest in them. Second, first my wife, then my kids. And it doesn't take a lot of time, but yes, I try and have one-on-one. -on -one. When I go shopping, I grab one. When I go to the bank, I grab one. There are challenges of many kids, and the one-on-one -on -one is a challenge, and there's different challenges when you have one kid. So each one has a struggle that we can think about and we can make it pay attention to, like the middle children. It's easy to pay attention to the oldest, and it's easy to pay attention to the youngest. So in my family, I go to the middle child first, just because I know the tendencies. I'm conscious of the time. So we still have two minutes. What means uh, one short question and one short answer. Здравствуйте. Спасибо вам большое. First channel. Okay, good. Спасибо большое за вашу речь. Очень близко то, что вы говорите. У меня есть вопрос. 
У меня два мальчика, два сына, 9-10 лет. Абсолютно полностью 24 часа мы проводим время вместе. Бабушек, дедушек они видят очень редко, поскольку находятся далеко. Это к тому, что контакт очень тесный. У меня вопрос. Ваши дети, мальчики, дерутся или нет? Дело в том, что до сегодняшнего дня мы обходились контактными играми. Я начала наблюдать, что в контактных играх они начинают нащупывать границы, вернее, их переходить, да, искать ту грань, где больно. Хотя э, на протяжении всех, всей жизни э, объяснялось, что друг другу больно делать нельзя. И мы обходились всегда этими беседами очень э, с пониманием. Понятно, да? Вот. Мне интересно, если происходят э, между вашими сыновьями контактные игры и бывают ли драки как вы разговариваете что вы объясняете и позволяете ли вы драться спасибо, спасибо. So, my, my boys they only fight all the time number one number two they play very rough games They play very rough games. As a dad, it's good to let them play rough games because even when they play rough games, there's still rules that I want to teach them. No biting, no hitting. They still have to learn the rules and that's important. Number three, so good, stay on the path. They will outgrow that. Number two, they sometimes, my boys go crazy because they have so much time together. They're sick of each other. So I'm always trying to let them have one time, a little space. Look for opportunities for one to leave so they have time apart and time together. This is the path. And it drives me crazy and I snap. Sometimes I can't be patient and I snap. And I wrote a book on parenting and I snap. <laughs> That's why you have to read to the end of the book where it talks about the joy of repentance. It's Thank you very much. Fantastic answer. Thank you.